What's going on, everybody? Welcome to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. And before we jump into today's conversation with Reese Douglas, there's a couple things we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews we get, the more it helps new people find the show, and it really helps to grow the community that we're developing here. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. And to everybody listening, make sure you screenshot this, post it to your Instagram story, tag at my social life podcast. And I'll feature you on the account and send you a message as well. Now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Reese Douglas. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. Today, I'm joined by Reese Douglas. Reese was a child actor, still acting today, but he was a child star in the show Waterloo Road, which is one of England's most popular dramas from the mid to late 2000s. And now Reese is also still acting, but he's also a tech founder where he's founded the company Social Plug. And I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Reese, welcome to the show. Cheers, man. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. So I want to start, obviously, with the natural place is acting. So by my research, you started acting when you were 13, right? Sure. Yeah, that's where it all started. And then so like when and like, why did you get into acting? So it wasn't a case of why. It was a case of how I ended up falling into it, to be quite honest with you. Um, I was never really academic in school. School didn't really interest me, not because uh, I wasn't clever. Uh, it was always disappointing for my parents being in. Uh, you know, speaking to my teacher saying, your child has great potential, but unfortunately he's just a class clown. <laughs> As I said, it just never really interests me, man. Um, and then I ended up in drama. I really enjoyed drama. It was hands-on. It was, I don't know, it just felt a place where I could be myself without being in trouble. Uh, and I could be that clown, I guess. Um, but the more I got into drama, I think it was an opportunity for my drama teacher to see that it was something that I was actually really good at. Uh, and as an audition came along for this program called Waterloo Road. And as you said, it was the most uh, nation's most watched series at the time. Um, and all my friends watched it, but I never really watched it. Um, and then before you know it, man, I, I managed to land the part and uh, my, my world was turned upside down. That's awesome. So it was Waterloo Road then your first, your first role? Yeah, I took about getting thrown in the deep end, right? Wow, that's crazy. So like you said, it was the most watched show at the time, but can you like contextualize like how popular it was like in terms of like from going as someone just in school one day, but then having a role in Waterloo Road the next, like how big a deal was that? It was great because first of all, I didn't have to go to school classes anymore. (laughs) I had a private tutor on set uh, and I used to play roller coaster tycoon and tell them it's for graphic design. So I never stopped being that clown. Um, but to give you a bit of context to how big the show was, I remember once we were, um, I used to have to wear hat and glasses everywhere, so I didn't get recognized. Uh, and my friends can vouch for that. Uh, I think one point where I realized how big this was when is one day I was in a train station, um, and there must have been a school trip or something at the time. Um, and I remember just walking to my train with about three or four of my friends, uh, and someone from a school recognized who I was off the show. So, and before I knew it, pretty much the whole train station had blocked around me. Um, and we had to get train security to come on the platform uh, and escort me onto my train. And we had to lock off a carriage just to get me away. That's insane. Ridiculous. Oh, wow. And so like your character on the show was Denzel Kelly. Can you kind of tell us about who that character was? Sure. So... There's different families in Waterloo Road, and a lot of the families tied in with the students to give more to the store. But it's a new family that were put in this show that were a deprived family from a rough estate. My sister's called Sambuca. You know, it's the name of a liquor, for God's sake. Uh, I was called Denzel. uh, And we were just all rascals. Denzel's main problem was not that he intended to be a bad person, but he was just naive and very vulnerable. And he always ended up in the wrong situations at the wrong time. Uh, and for most of the time, it was influenced by my older brother. Uh, and one of my first scenes, uh, he gave me his gun in school. Uh, and I ended up getting caught with it just to get a bit of context of the type of situations I ended up in. I was actually going to ask you about that scene because I went and I found that scene on YouTube and I watched it. Like that was a pretty intense scene as a kid to film, I'm guessing. Yeah, imagine, right? You've never acted in your life. You end up on a film set with people that you recognize. Uh, the next thing, one of your first ever scenes is you've got a real gun. 
Uh, you know, you've got a guy there that's telling me how to hold the gun, what not to do, what I should be doing. And then I've got a director telling me that, you know, a squad team are around the school. I could hear the sirens. I can see some of them. They've got assault rifles. They're telling me that they're going to be bursting into this room in a minute. Then I've got the head teacher that's going to try and get the gun off me. Like, I didn't have to act scared, but <laughs> I was scared. That's awesome. Like, that's, that's so intense, though. Like, and you were 13 at the time, right? 13. Wow, that's crazy. But then, so you talked about like how you don't really have to go to school anymore. It's like, what was your schedule like then when you were shooting the show? So I started when I was 13. So it was compulsory for me to do education at the time. So if I wasn't in school, I had to make up for my school hours on set, right? But the problem was when I was in school, it was worse because I was popping into classes, not knowing what day I was going to be on or what hour. It was hard for teachers to keep up with the curriculum so they know what work they'd give me. So they were just giving me any odd work. So the work that was actually being given wasn't relevant to what I was doing. And that's where I just fell out more out of love with the educational system because not only was it not helping me at the time I was actually there, but then also that when I was actually filming, I was getting work that wasn't relevant to what I was doing when I was actually in class. So it just ended up a complete mess, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and but, but so like then with the fact that you were on this show and everything, did, did teachers take it easy on you because of that? Okay, so <laughs> it's funny you say that actually, because I was never really, as I said, I was never academic anyway. I was always the class clown. So I wasn't on the teacher's best side. Um, and one day I remember I was in class and the deputy head teacher came in and something had happened. I can't remember the incident. And he turned around to me in front of everybody in the class. And he said, Reese, if you carry on with this behavior, I'll be taking you out of that TV show and you won't be doing it anymore. And because obviously of the person I was and how humiliated I was at the time by that comment from all my friends, I turned around to him and said, well, you can stop talking about me being part of the school and I'll just leave the school and go somewhere else. How about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so by that point, he was like, right, okay, get out of the class. It was a big mistake because he was the person that had to give me permission to go on the TV show. And it was hard because the schedules always changed. It was like my mum had to ring and say, hey, can you have this time off? Can you have this time off? So when he said that and I said that back, it probably wasn't the best comment to make. I mean, that's pretty fair. Were all teachers like that? Or I think I heard you tell a story somewhere where a teacher actually asked you for a photo because you're on the show. Yeah, I mean, that happened. It's, you know, the teacher had children uh, that weren't part of the school, like dinner ladies and stuff that would ask me for pictures. I remember walking around school. Sometimes, um, you know, I would have my school hour and people like kids, certainly like year sevens, newbies in the school that hadn't seen me but had heard I'm in the school would often flock me at lunch and stuff asking for pictures. Um, you know, sometimes I'd spend my, my lunch in the actual teacher's, in the teacher's room, uh, just to get away from it all. It was a bit crazy. So how did you handle all that? Like that level of celebrity so young where people are like flocking to you at lunchtime when you're at Trish, when you can't even take a train normally. Like how did you handle that whole part of being an actor? Well, you know what? It's because I was so young. So, you know, from 13 to 16, I've got to give all credit to my mom. Um, she was my uh, chaperone on set. She looked after me. Obviously, I wasn't old enough to be on set on my own. So rather than hire a, um, rather than hire, um, what they call it, a, um, a chaperone, it was my mum that did it for me. And she really kept my feet on the ground, to be quite honest with you, uh, financially, um, also in life as well. She really did guide me, and I think she helped a lot in that respect. There was one thing story I did want to ask you about. So I mentioned in the intro how you've started your own company. Now you've started Social Plug, but sure. that's that's not the first company that you started. You originally started a clothing line, I think, when you were 16, right? I did. I did, right? Yeah. Can you kind of tell that story? Sure. So um, I managed to build quite a large following on Twitter. Um, and obviously I had a lot of fans. I'd looked at my audience, I'd recognized a lot of them were girls. Uh, I wanted to do something with all the money that I'd accumulated from filming. Um, and I would say I was very naive because what I'd done was I decided that I wanted to start a business. Business is always something I've been passionate about, I've been interested in, I've always had dreams of owning my own business. Um, and you know, I wouldn't say that it scared me to ever work for somebody, but I knew that in this life while we're here, I had to want to do something for myself and work towards my own dreams, right? So 
I basically decided that I was going to start a women's clothing line. Do not ask what I thought I knew about women's clothes. <laughs> so basically, I had all this money. I decided to start going around all these shops, looking at handbags, coats, jumpers. My mum was having the time of her life. She was picking all this stuff out, going, the girls will love this, the girls will love that. We had a whole truck's worth of stock. We built this website, was raving about it going live. The day that it went live, not one person bought a product. Wow. I'd lost, I'd lost five figures. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then I was stuck with a hell of a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, and then I tried to get rid of it to friends and family. But, you know, as friends and family do, they bought a few pieces. I had no other choice but to get rid of it because obviously it was taking room up in the house, the loft. I ended up having to auction it off. I remember getting a check back for 19 pounds. Nine for all of the clothes you bought, you got 19 pounds back. All of the clothes. I remember them sending me pictures of the how they advertised it. You know, these were these were upmarket dresses that they took pictures of hanging off the hangers. Like they'd not even took decent pictures. And uh, they told me that a stockist was interested in buying the lot and it, they'd got it down to 19 pounds. And then they got back to me saying, am I happy with their service? <laughs> Holy shit. So it's like, with that, like looking back at that, what are some of the key takeaways you took from it? Like things you learned from trying to start your own business, your first one? So my first one, the big, big, big first lesson, and I know it sounds strange, but I'd actually never take it back because I learned one fundamental thing. Don't dive into something that you don't know about. Just because you're interested in something and might have the money to do it, don't just go in and jump in it. Research the market. Know why you're doing it and what you're doing it for. I had absolutely no idea about the customer and what value I was providing for them. I think I was a bit arrogant in the respect that I just thought people would buy it because they were my fans. I really didn't do my research in that respect. And secondly, don't go and spend an absolute fortune buying products. You only need to start with one. Um, and, you know, funnily enough, with my new company now, I'm actually selling clothes again. I'm actually selling the merchandise again. But only on this occasion, what I've learned from my last lesson was that now I only buy the products as they're sold. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm never wasting money. That's true. And you mentioned a little bit earlier, too, that you, you're gaining some popularity on Twitter as well. So, like, can you talk to me about that? Like, was it all from you just being on the show or did you do anything specifically to try and grow that Twitter account? Cause I think now you're sitting at over 33,000 followers. Yeah. You know, I, I really didn't. And my, my audience mainly grew on Twitter and this was before, this was before Instagram got big, right? Mm -hmm. And as big as the TV show was, I actually lost my role on the TV show through a tweet. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. So it got to a stage where they decided to move the show to another part of the country. And I'll never get my head around why, right? Because if it's not broke, don't fix it. But anyway, anyway, the show decided not to tell us. We had a Scottish head teacher come in the show two years prior to us finding out. So they knew all along what they were going to do. And we found out through the papers. So you can imagine, we come on set one day and we've got papers in our hands telling us that the show is moving. And not one of the production decided to tell us. So obviously, we reacted. And me being my 15-year-old self, tweeted, you know, absolutely can't believe the show is moving to Scotland. There's no chance I'm going. So I pretty much made my own bed. Mm -hmm. um, and a coach crash came along where we all had to get out of the coach and take a picture as, as we're moving up towards this new place. School's moving. And out of everybody, the whole school, all the teachers, me, being the nimblest, quickest guy, somehow manages to get hit by this coach. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I have to question how I was the one that managed to get hit, but, you know, put two and two together, I guess I've made my own bed. Um, and that's where I've realized the power of social media. Mm -hmm. Not only through me only losing my job on the show, but also the impact that one tweet had. Yeah. So do you, so today, like, do you have a love hate relationship Twitter then? Because as a result of Twitter, you lost, you lost your job because of it. Do you still enjoy Twitter though? Or do you still kind of like every time you log on, do you think of that tweet? No, not at all, man. Because 
I looked at the benefits of it. I looked at it and I thought, wow, look, look at the power of this thing. Um, I was asking, well, brands originally started asking me to send, send me products, right? Can you advertise this? Can you advertise that? I didn't mind it. Uh, my mum hated it. The postman did too, because it was like Christmas every day. They were getting <laughs> sick of parcels coming at my door. Um, but then I thought, why can't, why can't I make money out of this? Is it an opportunity to make money? And that's where, that's how I've got to where I am today, all through the realizing the power of social media and, and, and the demand for brands to want to get recognition on them. And so what were some of those like pack? You said it was Christmas every day. So what were some of those packages that you were getting in the mail? Oh man, I was like a kid at Christmas, bro. I was like, can I have a flying drone? Like Canada Goose, they like premium coat companies. I'll have those. I have to have some jumpers. I want the newest sneakers. Like whatever I asked for, I was getting it through my door. And it was so weird because they were thanking me for asking for it. That's crazy. Um, one other thing I was going to ask too, I noticed Steve Bartlett follows you on Twitter. So like, do you know him personally or when did he follow you? Sure. So, uh, Steve, uh, is local to me. I'm in the offices, not far from him. Obviously he's a busy, 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 busy guy. Um, but I've been watching his vlog since day one. I think he's an absolute inspiration, not only to our youth, but also as a thought leader in the social media sector. I've had the uh, I've had the opportunity to meet him a few times, but I don't know him personally. But I do okay. know his team. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, do any other celebrities did they follow you on Twitter when you were kind of blowing up? Is there anyone that followed you and you're like, "Wow, I can't believe they just followed me on Twitter"? Yeah, like quite a few people. Um, but I'd obviously built a, a contact base of celebrities just through being on the show and going to media events, and that's how I started to monetize brands sending me products. Because what I decided to do was I would ask celebrities what products they're looking for, what they're after. I would get small brands in the local community to sign a subscription. And I started an agency. And all I had to do was get one of their products on the back of one of my celebrity friends and they would pay the subscription. And that was my first social media agency called Brand Endorsement. Okay, I was actually gonna ask you about brand endorsements. That was kind of was that your first move once you finished Waterloo Road? Yeah, so I mean it did snowball. I got other TV opportunities. But in terms of business, that was where I was like, okay, cool. There seems to be an opportunity here. Um and that's where, yeah, that's where the agency started back in 2016. Uh I did it for a year, it went well. I managed to turn over five figures. Uh, But I also came across some massive scalability issues. Um, And that's when I realized that I was in the influencer marketing sector, Um, realizing it was becoming a 10 billion industry. I looked at how quick the industry was growing. I looked at the demand, obviously through myself, uh, through other brands wanting to get their products on the back of other celebrities. Um, And that's when I was like, wow, this is a massive market and it's growing quickly. How do I capitalize? And so in your case, what were some of those scalability issues? Okay. So when obviously I was running myself as an agency, um, I had to start proving what my what return and investment was for a brand, right? So if they were to give me a hundred quid subscription, how do I prove that they're going to get at least, I don't know, at least their hundred quid back? ROI and in influence marketing is difficult because you're messing with people's personal data rather than an ad on Google, for example. So first fundamental thing with, with digital media channel is you want to make sure that you're advertising to the right audience. Because I was putting products on the back of celebrities through Twitter and Instagram, I couldn't see who their audience were. So they were either screenshotting it and I had to rely on what they were saying and what, they were, or what I was seeing, or I had to ask for it. And it was an absolute ball ache. Um, and then not only having to ask for all those insights, I was then having to negotiate prices. And celebrities are a nightmare, you know. Uh, you know, celebrities, oh, that this person, they've got this many followers, I'm going to charge you a thousand pounds per post. And then another celebrity would want to charge two thousand pounds per so I've got sp- I've got all these celebrities costing different amounts. I don't know who uh, I don't know who their audience are. So if I'm a marketer to the right audience, I've also got influencer fraud. So I don't know if a lot of these celebrities have bought their followers. Uh, and I was having a lot of trouble trying to calculate the return and investment uh, with these celebrities as well. The only way I could really track it was through discounts and promo code links. 
Uh, but, you know, to do that myself at scale was an absolute nightmare. Uh, and that's why I thought, is this just me having this problem or a lot of other people and other agencies? And uh, after, you know, asking a few questions around, I realized, yeah, a lot of people are, in fact, most. Okay. And then so was then basically it was from brand endorsement where you got the idea for social plug. Yeah. So, you know, I come across brand endorsement, I turned over this amount of money and then I was like, I can't go any further. I can't scale on my own. I've come across all these technical issues. How do I resolve this? And that's where I was like, I've never in my life been into software. I can't write a line of code. How the hell am I going to provide a solution to this problem? Um, So the first thing I knew I needed to do was get a mentor. I needed somebody that had knowledge in the tech sector Uh, that had knowledge of social media. um, And I managed to plug myself into a cloud hosting company called Tech Manchester. uh, And they were providing a workshop where I could go and find a mentor that was relevant to my business. I'd managed to get my first match. um, And I even managed to get myself on a podcast with the CEO of this cloud hosting company. um, And that's now turning over 300 million. And off the back of that podcast, I'd managed to get a lot of people that said, you know what, Reese, we think it's not only is this a great idea, but we're in fact a company that's having these issues. How can you provide the solution for us? And it's just gone from there ever since. Wow. So can you kind of explain the the current state of social, like what the offering is based off, like how you're helping these companies now? Sure. So social plug, essentially what it does is it connects brands and social media influencers with absolute no risk. What I've had to do is develop how this platform is going to work. How do I fundamentally, how do I fundamentally make all these problems uh, go away and provide a solution for it? The first problem I was having as an agency was how do you find all these influencers, right? Uh, You don't know if they're legitimate. You don't know who their audience are. uh, You don't know which brands they've collaborated with in the past, if they're a competitor. uh, You don't know how much they're going to charge. Uh, You don't know what their engagement rate's like. It's a nightmare. So I knew straight away that I needed access to this this information. Uh, The only way I could get access to that information was by them enrolling onto a platform. So Social Plug's going to be a web platform for brands, and it's going to be an app for influencers. And essentially what it does is for influencers is once you sign up to our, uh, once you sign up to our app, it gives us permission to look at all your social media insights. So straight away from the, from the offset, we've got all the data we need then that a brand needs. Um, and what that enables a brand to do is to set up a campaign on their web portal, which will include their campaign brief, it'll include their requirements, it'll include their budget. And what we'll do as a data platform is we'll take all that relevant information and then we'll only show that offer to influencers that resonate with that, with that information. Um, so that's where, we, that's where the connection comes into it. So not only do we enable brands and uh, not only do we enable influencers to come to brands, but we also are able to set up campaigns uh, and, and track our, uh, the ROI, the return on investment. And so like that, I really like the sound of that, but you mentioned how you don't really have much technical experience, right? Like you said, you can't really write a line of code. So have you taught yourself and learned through your mentor how to do all this or do you have additional help with you? So I think from my first lesson, on the clothing business of losing five figures. As I said before, don't go into something that you don't know about. And if you really are not good at something and you know that you're not good at it, concentrate on what you are good at. I knew that from obviously the clothing business and I didn't want to make the same mistake twice. So I decided that I needed to speak to somebody that had this technical ability. You know, I don't want to go and throw my money at an agency or a developer when they tell me that they can do this, it's going to be this, it's going to be this amazing golden platform, and then only find out that I've got a bag of peanuts, right? Mm-hmm. So I spoke to somebody about the idea that can code, that's been a developer, a manager of, of developers uh, all around the Euro, Euro, uh, Europe. I was introduced to him through my mentor, actually. Um, and he just kind of like, he was, he was somebody that I could speak to, get some partial advice from. And within two months, he pretty much started to fall in love with it, with the company. He liked the idea that much. He's now on board and he's now, he's now my CTO. 
Um, That's so he deals with everything in regards to the tech and I can focus on what I'm good at, the product and sales. That's awesome. And so how did you find him? Was he like someone you'd known beforehand or, or did you go out seeking someone that knew how to code? So obviously I had my mentor, I built a good relationship with him at this point. He used to be in the software industry. Um, now, uh, this gentleman called Amir uh, used to work for my mentor and he used to manage about 200 developers all around Europe. Um, so as I said, he just introduced me to him initially to get some partial advice. The more I spoke to him, the more we built a relationship and God knows, looking back, I don't know how I've managed it, but now he's my CTO. <laughs> awesome. And then, so I kind of double back actually. And when did you decide that you needed a mentor? Was it just with the technical aspects or what other reasons were you like, I need to go out and find myself a mentor? I guess for anybody listening to this, that is actually interested in starting a business, I would fundamentally say from the offset, get a mentor, get somebody that has experience, that's done it before, that you can get some partial advice on. It, it will just save you so much time, so much money, and somebody that you can speak to, somebody that you can relate your problems with. And that helps, you know, business isn't easy. There's a lot of hiccups. Uh, you know, sometimes it can, it can get you into depression, anxiety. It's just great to have somebody there that you can get some advice from and help you. So the second that I knew I wanted to provide a solution to this, this problem in the influence marketing sector, I needed to find somebody that understood it. So straight away from day one, I had a mentor. And so like, what's your relationship with your mentor look like on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis? Are you talking every day or just every once in a while? Is it scheduled calls or just kind of whenever you need something? So, so the beautiful thing about Tech Manchester was not only did they help me match with a mentor, but they put a program in place that tells you how often you should be communicating, what you should be communicating about, and then tracking your progress, which is great. But we've got to a stage now where we're kind of past it. You know, there's no real structure or framework that can cater to your business and your needs. So we've now built a relationship where as soon as I come across a problem, I need to pick up the phone. I text him. I say, hey, are you free? More, more times than not, he is. And we speak. So we speak often and as often as we need to. That's awesome. And then so you said he introduced you to your now CTO. Is there, do you have other people within the company or is it just you two still? So at this stage, it's just me and him, um, and we will keep it as small as, as small as a team as possible until we actually get the product to market, start showing traction, and then we'll look at hiring, uh, but only as and when we need it. We don't want really to be wasting money, especially as a, as a, you know, a startup. Yeah, that's fair. But then in, in speaking of money, when it comes to a startup, have you done any fundraising for your company yet? So this is the exact stage we're at now. So we've, we've established what the minimum viable product is. Uh, we've built users. So we've got people, businesses, <clears throat> that includes enterprises, it includes agencies, and it includes uh, small, medium enterprises. So small brands, including restaurants, retailers, that all want to use the platform. Uh, so much so that, you know, I think they've realized how big the influence marketing sector is that they don't want to enter the influence marketing gray area, as I call it, without going through my platform. So we've now got letter of intent uh, worth a value of 50,000 uh, pounds of users that want to use social club platform. Um, so we're going to use that as leverage for investors now. Um, and we're trying to raise 50,000 pounds to get the product to market. So we're currently speaking and pitching at different events to try and get that interest. My first official pitch is going to be the 12th of September, uh, pitching to some of the biggest investors in and around Manchester. So really excited about that. That's awesome. So how did you find that opportunity? Because I feel like with some people when they're, they want to start a company and they're kind of in the early stages, but they don't necessarily know where to find funding. So how did you figure out where to go and how did you get into that where you're pitching to some of the biggest companies in Manchester? Really good question. Um, so I kind of did it backwards. Um, and I don't know if I actually planned this or it kind of came to me, but I actually started going to pitch practice sessions. I looked on Eventbrite, I looked at pitching sessions, and it was just an opportunity for businesses to pitch, not to an actual investor, but to people that are either actually are investors or associated with investors. So indirectly, whether or not I realized it, I was getting some really, really good good advice from people that have invested in businesses in the past um, and that kind of opened up the network so as soon as I was ready to actually raise investment 
I already had contacts from people I'd pitched to, to say, hey, go to this event, go to that event, speak to this person, speak to that person. Um, so yeah, I kind of started with a base of practicing and then that opened up to a, a larger network where I could actually start officially pitching to people. I think that's extremely smart though, right? Like going, you one, you're making those contacts, which is great, but two, you're refining your pitch as you're going as well. So you're not exactly. just going to your... Exactly, yeah. I mean, and I guess a lot of businesses could potentially make that mistake, right? Where you've got your business, you've got this great idea, um, you're, you're certain that you need investment, and then you go and pitch to the most ideal investor within your, your vicinity, right? Um, and you might have an absolutely amazing business idea, but because that was your first ever pitch, you're a bit rusty, uh, you weren't sure on everything that an investor might ask, and you lost out on a great opportunity there, simply because you put all your eggs in one basket and went for the, the first and the biggest investor when you've not had the prior experience. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I feel like a lot of people, they want that ideal investor first, but in your case, like it makes perfect sense to not go for sure. that person. So you can't start from find the bottom. It. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying um, take everybody's advice. I remember, so does GDPR um, affect you guys? I don't know if I'm being completely honest. So, so GDPR is like this new legislation brought out in the UK where basically everybody, everybody's data is now private. So, you know, if a business has emails that they've scraped from websites and things like that, their person, that's now personal information. You can't share that. Um, so I was told by an investor, one of my first ever pitches that once GDPR comes into place, influencer marketing is going to be dead. Okay. So if I, if I had took my, if I had took that person's advice, you know, God knows where I'd be right now. So, uh, you know, that, I think that's a message to to anybody that is pitching. Don't always take an investor's advice as gold because not everybody's right. Um, but I would, as I said before, always start small. Um, don't try and be perfect. Listen to people, learn, and yeah, and, and work your way up as you go along. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great advice because I feel like, especially if someone that's new into the space, they're going to take everything that, the investor potential investors say to them like yeah, fully and, and naturally you think that right you think oh my god an investor shit i need to take every word he says for it um but you know some people you know p- investors whatever their role is people are people and people have opinions and people's opinions aren't always right and then so back to social plug where it currently sits when you roll it out to the public is it going to be are you going to start locally and make it manchester based or are you going to kind of go wider than that Yes, I, I want to start with Manchester. I want to start with small to medium enterprises to, to start with. <clears throat> I just really want to start fueling that matchmaking process between brands and influencers. Um, as we start to see more and more connections and start to understand how they're interacting with the platform, uh, we then want to obviously be able to rapidly scale uh, and then go e-commerce. When I say e-commerce, I mean brands that are, uh, you know, like Pretty Little Thing, Boohoo, some massive, massive brands where they can use influencers nationwide. Uh, it's not necessarily based on their location. It's just based on their engagement. Yeah, so I basically just want to start start really small, learn how people are interacting with the platform, and then look at obviously expanding then and, and, and using e-commerce brands where we can start to use hundreds of influencers at one time. Yeah. And that, I mean, when it comes to influencers and those companies, how have you found going about recruiting influencers to use the platform and recruiting brands to sign on as well? So because I've been at this for like, it feels like a lifetime, you know, I'm I'm two years down the line now, I'm still yet to have any tech in place. Uh, But just by word of mouth networking, I've managed to register 300 influencers up to now. Uh, But I've also found a very, very let's say clever strategy to acquire over a million influencers at one time. Wow. I mean, I'm sure you don't want to share any of that because that's probably like one of your, your secrets, right? No, no, I I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, So basically with Instagram's API, so for anybody that's quite technically orientated, Instagram recently closed their public API, which is linked with Cambridge Analytica and people's personal data. There was a lot of social media platforms already out there that were scraping information from influencers and selling it to brands as and when they needed it. When Instagram's API depreciated uh, the late end of last year, that then obviously um, turned all these software companies dormant. So what it's pretty much done is, I was scared at first because I thought, oh my God, it's gonna affect social plug. 
The difference being was <clears throat> influencers enroll onto my platform, which gives us permission to access that data. These platforms didn't do that. So when the Instagram shut, uh, when the API shut down, they no longer had access to all this information. So it's pretty much just a graveyard full of all this information of influencers now. So what we'll do is we'll take a massive brief from a brand. So when a brand uploads a brief, let's, let's use an e-commerce brand, for example. They want to work with 200 influencers uh, from a certain location, certain gender, certain age. We can then go onto these dormant graveyard platforms and then pitch to them based on the opportunity that's already there and use clever strategies, probably through a bit of A-B testing, uh, and then obviously get them to enroll onto Social Plug. So we don't even have to shout about how great the platform is. We're just shouting, saying, hey, we've got this amazing brand that wants to work with you. Jump onto Social Plug to get kickstarted. Mm -hmm. And then so oh, those influencers you have currently, are they all Manchester-based or is it Manchester companies with influencers outside? Yes, yeah, so the 300 that I have registered are all Manchester-based to begin with. Uh, obviously, once I start acquiring these graveyard platforms, um, that's when we'll start looking at, at rapidly growing nationwide. Okay. And then, so does your, your fame from Waterloo Road and your other acting roles, has that helped you at all in the entrepreneur space? <laughs> I'd say it's helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say it's helped. I mean, Tech Manchester has not been around long. Uh, this is really helping startup entrepreneurs not only find mentors, but provide them with workshops around finance, law. Uh, social media, you name it. So I kind of, I, I, they kind of use me as an ambassador because I've already got a name for myself in and around the Manchester community. They've used me as an ambassador. It's helped me get podcasts with, obviously, the CEO of, of UK Fast. Um, it's plugged me into some of the biggest uh, brands in Manchester. So yeah, I guess it's given me credibility would be the right word to use. Yeah, that's fair. And one thing I actually intended to ask you earlier was that when you had your agency and you had brand endorsement, you were also helping clients grow their social media, right? Yeah. So with the celebrities we were using, they were posting about it. And yes, that was encouraging people to then go and follow the brand. I wouldn't say I was specifically concentrating on brands growing their following, but as a result of influencer marketing, it naturally helped. There was one story I saw. It was a quote somewhere. I think it was in an article where it said you helped increase someone's month-to-month uh, -month revenue by over 1,500%. Can you tell that's, that story? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, this was one of my first campaigns where he said, right, okay, we've done a bit of testing. We think the, the model works. We want to give you £2,000 for a campaign. Um, they agreed to do it. <clears throat> we used about 15 influencers. Biggest mistake I made was I spent half the budget on one big influencer. Um, some of them now are referred to as hero influencers. So, so let's, call, let's call this person a celebrity. They were a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And I spent the other thousand pounds on micro influencers. Uh, people like me and you that have built small communities of followers. Um, and what I'd realized was that in fact, all the micro influencers collectively drove, I would say, three quarters of that return in investment. Uh, and the actual hero, celebrity influencer, didn't really drive any sales at all. That's interesting because influencer marketing as a whole is shifting towards micro-influencers. And you have a case yeah. study that like, perfectly complements that. That's correct. So is that something you're noticing as a trend as a whole? Or is it, do you think it was just specific to this one case? I think, look, I think for anybody, obviously, that listens to, that's on social media, and, you know, obviously listening to this through social media, we look at the way it's going, you know, we don't really believe what Kim Kardashian's promoting anymore. We don't believe, you know, what David Beckham, the footballer, is talking about, because we all know they're being paid for it, right? Uh, and I think now the way that social media is moving, we're just wising up to exactly why people are promoting things. And I think what fundamentally wins is authenticity. and authenticity comes from word of mouth you know there's no stronger belief than what somebody says if it's if it's not through off if it's through our family and friends right and that's what micro influencing is you know micro influencers are people that we truly believe in they're our friends they're our family the people that have grown a small community that still care about what their audience think about them kim kardashian doesn't necessarily care as much because her following so big but for a micro influencer they really care about what their audience think about them. And they really want to make sure that the products they talk about are actually 
uh, you know, have value to them and they truly believe in it. And that's why it drives so much engagement and, you know, on the other hand, return on investment for brands. And I think a good thing about that too is with micro influencers becoming the current trend is it makes the barrier to entry to becoming a quote unquote influencer easier than if it, when people think that you need to have millions of followers to get products and do deals like this. But now if you have a couple thousand followers, you can do it. Exactly. And that's, you know, and that's, and that's, I think that's one of the unique offerings of social plug. We are plugging into all these micro influencers and providing a solution that, you know, fundamentally I had an issue with as it was running an agency. So we're going to be enabling brands of all shapes and sizes to work with all these micro influencers at scale. And, you know, we're not, and on the other hand, if you're an influencer, a micro influencer, we're going to be offering you opportunities to big brands. Um, and the problem is with these micro influencers, because they've not got large audiences, you've got all these massive brands that are just offering them products. And pretty much saying, you know, because you've only got 10 or 30,000 followers, you should be grateful that you're working with a brand like us. So you're only going to get offered a product. Um, but, you know, me, myself, all the micro influencers, we're wise now. We understand that collectively we're driving more sales than the Kim Kardashians and the David Beckhams. So my, my, my platform is going to make sure that every single micro influencer is paid for their time and their commitment to a collaboration and not just offered a product. That's awesome. Is there like a specific rate you're going to set, like depending on followers or how are you going to determine the valuation of each individual influencer? So this is where it's really interesting, right? Because if you look at the pricing model for influencers at the minute, there's certain gauges that you should charge an influencer based on how many followers they have and what their engagement rate is. But I don't believe in that because on the other side, I also believe that influencers should work with brands if they genuinely do like the product. So what my platform does is it enables a brand to put up a product and put up a, a, a campaign. And then it also allows them to put out how much they're willing to pay for post. So then it's up to the influencer whether they decide to work with a brand based on how much they're offering. So then you may have, a, you may have a, an influencer with a million followers working with a brand for 100, 100 quid, $100, simply because they actually love the product. Mm -hmm. that's interesting it kind of puts the onus on the influencer to really figure out their valuation but you're not letting them do it for free though right like that's part of the platform exactly if you want to work with a brand you're going to get paid for it if you really like a product but they're paying too low then it's going to be the incentive of the brand to up the price of a post if they're not getting enough interest mm -hmm. that's interesting and one other thing too i guess with it, micro influencers becoming a thing is do you think we'll see a decrease in influencer fraud because less people will be buying followers to try and pump their numbers up to try and get brand deals do you think i'll see uh, I, less influencer fraud yeah correct um i know i think it's going to get more prevalent i think it's going to increase i think any influencer that really cares about their audience will understand that the way instagram's algorithms are working that they're not going to be getting their engagement that they should be getting if they're buying fake followers um, and I think there's going to be a time, certainly the way Instagram's moving with shop commerce, that once shop commerce comes out and we can start to track exactly how many sales an influencer is making directly through the platform, that's when influencers uh, and how many followers they've got are going to become irrelevant. It's all going to come down to how many sales they can drive. So yes, I can see it at the minute increasing influencer fraud. I think a lot of brands are still uh, unbeknown. I think it's a massive gray area in regards to how to detect influencer fraud. But in the future, I think the platforms will bring out things like shop commerce, which is fundamentally going to change that. And so at the current state of social, then what are kind of your tips and your advice for like filtering through influencer fraud? Like who, like what are some things you look for to determine whether someone has bought their followers and they have false engagement versus someone that's organic? Uh, so when I was running an agency, some of the uh, some of the things that I would do, uh, I would look at certain websites, and this is another problem I was having. I was jumping from platform to platform, trying to vet influencers. <clears throat> I used to go on a website called Influencer Marketing Hub. Number one, I could go in it and I could check the authenticity of their followers, so it would enable me to see how often their audience were interacting with their posts. It would enable me to see any spikes in their followers. So let's say, uh, let's say last week they've suddenly uh, their followers have suddenly gone up by two thousand. I would have to see if that's correlated to any PR they've recently had. If not, 
that's a sign that they've obviously just gone ahead and bought those followers. Um, so this website would enable me to check all those kind of little things to see if their followers were legitimate. It would allow me to check their engagement rate. So if you've got 10,000 followers, um, you know, you should be on average getting, you know, at least 10% engagement. I know it's a lot, 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 lot lower now. Um, but you know, you would check it against the industry benchmarks. Um, and then you could also check on average how much they should be charging per post. Mm-hmm. And those were the, 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 the processes I would take. Uh, and as you can imagine, it took a long time when I was doing that scale. Oh, I can imagine. I was going to ask now, how do you do that with social plug? Like how do you eliminate people that have purchased their followers and how do you plan to do it at scale once you get ready for that? That's a really, really interesting question. And it's something that I've, I've kind of ideated around for a while now. Um, and I think this is where I've really got to establish what social plug is and where our value is as a platform. So I've got to look at the future. I look at where we are now and I've realized that, okay, let's use you as an example, Jacob, you're an influencer. Uh, let's say that when you first started as an influencer, you wanted to get started and you decided that you were going to purchase your first 10,000 followers, right? Um, but over that space of time, you've actually managed to build an authentic audience. So you've built yourself to 50,000 followers and 10,000 followers of those are fake, right? Mm-hmm. When you enroll onto most platforms, they'll recognize that most of the, like, to, uh, you know, a fifth of your followers are fake. Some of these platforms, if not most, won't allow you on the platform because they're saying, no, one fifth of your followers are fake. We're not going to let you on this platform. But I don't want to do that. I actually want to enroll all influencers within a certain, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be ridiculous and say, you know, we're going to let somebody on the platform that's got 90, you know, 90% fake followers. But what I am saying is if, if, if we're, we're not going to start, we're not going to start uh, negotiating around numbers that we're going to let on the platform, we're going to let influencers onto the platform and we're going to let our data and insights tell a brand everything they need to know about that influencer. So then it's up to them based on the data that we provide them, whether they want to work with that influencer. So we're not making the decision. It's just enabling brands to make data informed decisions. And what are some of those data points that you're going to measure that allow brands to know who they should work with and whether a campaign was successful or not? Sure. So when an influencer first enrolls up, that will give us insights into their engagement rate. Uh, It will allow us to obviously see how many followers they've got. And it will allow us to see their, on average, audience reach per post. Once and then once a brand has collaborated with an influencer, we will then have all the information we need to see the insights of uh, their audience reach per post, if they've drove any sales, uh, how good their content quality was. Uh, it's going to allow a brand to review that influencer. And then once that information has happened, once that initial collaboration has happened, We'll then open that information up to the whole marketplace, so all the brands can see it. Um, and then, and then you know, in the future, what we'll start to look at is seeing all these influencers, uh, you know, start to build data based on the collaborations, so brands can start to really hone in on the influencers they want to work with based on the information we've provided. That's interesting. And so as I think you're the perfect like person to found this company because you have experience on both sides. You have experience as an influencer. And as someone that's working more on the brand side, so you're really able to speak to both sides, which is awesome. Definitely. Uh, Yeah, definitely. But I wanted to ask about social media itself and the social plug Instagram right now. I couldn't figure out the name is at Brandon. Oh, Brandon Doris Limited, right? It was. I've actually changed it. Oh, you've recently changed it. I've recently changed it to socially plug. Someone's got social plug, man. Uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and sort something out. I think it's a spam account as well. It's a joke. So I need to try and uh, I need to try and get around that. So if there's anyone listening that can help me out, you know, please, please do. Um, but yeah, brand endorsement was my original agency. You know, uh, I need to change that over to social book now. Mm-hmm. And then so like it hasn't really been an active account. Are you planning to really start using it more actively? Yeah. So I think you know I, I, I'm obviously I've been on this at my own at the minute. You know, time's really valuable to me. Uh, I've been focusing on the product. I've been focusing on the strategy to get it to market, uh, focusing on investment. There's only so much I can do. Uh, I don't just want to be posting for posting's sake. I actually really want, I actually want to use the social plug Instagram to start building a community of influencers that enables them to speak um, and really understand what their needs are and how we can cater for that. 
So once we're at a stage where the platform's actually up and running, that's where we'll really start to work on the social club platform on Instagram uh, and start to accumulate influencers on there and get them talking. That's right. And then what about your personal Instagram? You said you don't post just for posting sake. And I noticed you don't really post very often on your personal Instagram either. Yeah, I mean, I've, I post stories now and again, um, but I like to provide value. I don't just like posting for the sake of posting or I don't like posting going out for beers with my mates. I really don't understand why people post a, you know, a, a story that they're getting in the bath. Like, who cares? You know, um, I, want to, I, want, I want to use Instagram as an opportunity to not only teach people about my lessons, but also you know, my learnings and how anybody that's looking at it that might, it might appeal to. Uh, you know how 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 it could benefit from them. So yeah, I like to post things that are valuable. Mm-hmm. And then, so do you think though, if you really wanted to, like, if you wanted to really grow and scale your Instagram, if you dedicated time to it, you'd be able to do that. Hundred percent, and that's something that I'm definitely interested in putting a strategy in towards. Um, but you know, Instagram is Instagram is a full time job. Uh, I know how the algorithms work. You should be posting frequently to for for the algorithms to pay for you. It's just a case of having that time. Uh, and once the platform's up and running, we've got the money in, I can start allocating the time towards that and really start working on it. And it's like, other than posting frequently, what are some other things that you would do in that scenario when trying to grow on Instagram? Just kind of like advice for other people that want to grow theirs. Uh, okay, so in the, in, let's talk in the topic of influencer marketing. Let's say somebody's interested in becoming an influencer. <clears throat> you want to be talking about that specific product as much as possible. Um, let's use food for an example. If you absolutely love cooking, you know, you want to be posting every night about your dishes. Uh, what have you had for dinner? How have you made it? What ingredients did you buy? I'm posting about it a lot. Um, you know, I would be searching hashtags. That I'd be asking to, for pages that are bigger than mine to repurpose my content and my ingredients. Uh, I'd be looking at paid social with obviously organic on, on the decline now. Uh, and try and get my content out as much people as possible. Um, and, and then slowly look at you know how that affects my followers and learning from what I'm getting back, uh, changing strategy, seeing what people are interested in. Are people interested in what I'm cooking for dinner rather than what I'm having for breakfast? Um, and you know, catering to people's needs, literally. Um, <laughs> and, and go from there. I definitely think like what my take from that is really just look at what the data is telling you and then make your decision exactly. based off that. Exactly, yeah. And so are you still acting today, like on top of everything that you're doing with social plug is acting still something you're doing? Sure. So I often go to auditions. I'm still auditioning. Um, often in London, I'm from Manchester. So I'm often <coughs> going down South for auditions. So I recently did uh, banged up abroad. That was actually shown in the States as well. Uh, on, I think it was MBS, I'm not too sure. Or NBC, I'm not too sure on that. Um, but yeah, I recently flew to Colombia, Bogota. Um, and I had it egg like this American guy, right? <laughs> so I had a dialect coach for a while. They were teaching me the American dialect. Um, and yeah, I flew out to Columbia and that was really exciting. So I did that for about two weeks. Okay. And so it was like, would you say that your, your acting is not quite as much as you used to be doing because you're focused on the business? So acting isn't a case of how strange Steve Barlett is currently walking past the window. No way. I swear to God, he's got his dog with him, Pablo. That's hilarious. How strange is that? Um, so yeah, I'm not acting as much as as, um, as I'd like to, but it's just a case of opportunities. Okay, that's fair enough. And so when you're traveling down south, like higher, down to London, it's about two hours away from you, right? Yes, on the train. So how often would you say you're going down there? Uh, I'm auditioning probably once a month down south. I'm auditioning a lot more here. Okay. And on top of that as well, you're modeling too, right? Yes. Don't know how. I don't know how. They must be blind. <laughs> and so were you modeling prior to getting on Waterloo Road or was it like from Waterloo yeah, Road? So my mom used to be a catwalk model. Uh, and then obviously uh, she became pregnant with myself. And the agency were like, you know, bring him in. We want to see him. Bring him in. Bring him in. Um, so I was this little baby, I was in the agency, and they said, we're going to start modeling babies. Um, and then before you know it, I'd become a, a baby model and had pretty much stayed with them ever since. Wow, that's awesome. So you've literally pretty much been modeling since you were born. Yeah, I've, been, I've now been at the agency longer than the staff that were there. That's crazy. And then another thing <laughs> that you're doing as well, I wanted to ask you about Sidley. 
Oh, okay, cool. So how does that work? So it's a traveling celebrity football team, right? That's a traveling celebrity football team. Uh, we focused on raising money for bereaving families. Um, and, you know, that may be a child that's lost their mom and dad. It may be, uh, it may be a child that has no, yeah, has, has no parents. Uh, but yet, you know, they've still got their siblings to look after, including themselves, a mortgage to pay for, uh, food, electric, gas. Um, and that's what our, our charity focuses on, uh, providing that support for individuals that have lost a loved one and, you know, need that, need that support and emotionally, so, and financially. And so how did that opportunity come about to you? Like when, how long have you been with the team? Uh, I've been with them for about four or five years now. Uh, and we travel all around the UK. We've actually flew to Ireland, I think twice now. Uh, and we play against uh, other businesses that either sponsor the charity, uh, but we also play testimonials as well. So ex-football legends uh, come back to obviously see all their fans and we play against them. And it's amazing because I love football. Um, and it's closest feeling to feeling like an actual footballer when you're in a stadium playing it with thousands of people. Um, and we've got ex-football legends that play on our team as well. You know, we've got Wes Brown who plays for us. He's uh, an ex-United legend. He's won the Champions League with United. You know, I'm playing alongside him. He's passing me the ball and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, man, thoroughly enjoy it. What an amazing cause it is. That's awesome. And speaking of United, you also got Wayne Rooney to photo photograph with one of the jerseys, right? That's correct, yeah. So did you have the opportunity to meet him? So I didn't have the opportunity to meet Wayne Rooney. Uh, but apart from that, we, I did have the opportunity to play with Paul Scholes. Uh, and I'm even more impressed with that because I, I do consider him even more of a legend, if not one of United's biggest legends. Um, so I played against him as part of the charity. And that was an amazing experience as well. That's awesome. But then, so with how often do you play then with Sidley? Like how often do you travel? Uh, I think it's on for like five to six months of the year. So it's like five, four to five on and the rest off. Um, and then for the four to five that are, uh, that are on, we play once a fortnight, once every three weeks, sometimes every week, depending on how many games we have organized for that year. Okay. And then so like with that in mind, with you playing on this football team, you're still modeling, you're still acting, you're going to auditions, you're running a company. How, how do you balance everything? It's really not as busy as it sounds, you know, like these are opportunities that I'm talking about. Not all these opportunities are running at one time. So if I was doing acting, you know, that was in Bogota, Colombia for two weeks. You know, if I'm modeling uh, and I get a modeling job, which is probably once to twice a month, you know, I'm doing that for a day. Um, you know, with Sidley, that's on a Saturday or a Sunday. Sometimes it's overnight. So that's on the weekend. So I've still got all the week to work on my company. That's fair enough. And then I wanted to ask you about this quote that you said, or you wrote it somewhere, and it was, eating shit now is important to be successful later. Can you kind of elaborate on that? I said that? I believe so. I wrote it down here with quotations. Eating shit now. To be successful is later. Uh, that's really interesting. I don't recall saying that. I don't know where you found that, um, but I, I like it and I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's important. You know, I think any, any, any opportunity somebody has, any solution that somebody wants to provide, you have to understand what the problems are. And to really, really understand the problems, I think you've got to go through them. You know, I think for anybody that wants to be successful, you have to come from the ground up. That not only gives you gratitude from the person that you've become, but also makes you understand exactly what you're providing as a solution. For me, I've been through, with Social Plug, I've been an influencer. I've realized the problem that I've had through being an influencer, started an agency, realized the problem I had as an agency, and now with Social Plug, understanding both sides of the market, now in a place to provide a solution. I would never ever be in this position if I hadn't lost the 10,000 and learned from my mistakes, if I hadn't been an influencer that was having trouble monetizing, if I hadn't started this agency trying to help brands get on social media. Um, you know, I've been through all these problems to get in this situation where I am now. And I think for anybody, it's really, really important to go through that struggle, to really, really understand what it is you're providing a solution for and to have that gratitude and to have that humility humility 
Mm -hmm. And so speaking of how you have like both sides, like the influencer side and the other side, and you mentioned how you want to devote more time in the future to your Instagram. Do you also think that you'll devote some time to YouTube as well? Yeah, definitely. Uh, You know, I have visions of obviously one day owning my own office. I'd love to do a weekly podcast um, similar to what Steve's done with his vlogs. I think it's amazing, um, you know, to talk about our, our day ins and day outs of running a tech company, what it's like, what we get up to, what our problems are. And I think, as uh, you know, I think further down the line, the business gets the more opportunities and doors that will open for us to start really pushing content out there. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, I noticed with your personal YouTube as well, you've done one video before, like one like sit down video. And I wanted to ask you about the content of that video. You, it was, you're talking about turning down the opportunity to be on Love Island. Love Island, Love Island is a massive, massive reality TV show. I would say quite easily one of the most popular in the UK right now. Uh, for anybody that goes on Love Island, they're coming out with at least six figures based on you know, brand collaborations through becoming this hero influencer. Um, and for me, I, I turned it down, Jacob, because it's not, it's not who I wanted to become. I think going into the business world, I wanted to be taken seriously. Um, certainly, it would, it would certainly have repercussions on my acting. Uh, you know, I struggle to see many successful actors that have given themselves away as reality TV stars. Um, so, yeah, it, it, although it could have opened such amazing opportunities, it wasn't the opportunities that I was interested in. Mm-hmm. I really like, I think that's interesting too, because I feel like most people, especially in your situation where they're trying to grow a company as well, they'd be like, well, this is just the easy step for me to take. But I like that you're trying to do it. Now, I don't know if the proper way is the right way to say it, but you want to do it your way without taking that shortcut. That's not necessarily going to be the best way for you. Yeah, exactly. And then, so, but I did want to talk about the current state of social media. Like, do you think social media as a whole is good for us as a society? Okay. That's... Can, can you give me some more context? I'm just like, because I feel like a lot of people now are starting to notice the negative sides of social media when it comes to mental health and we're spending too much time on it. And I've heard people argue both sides that social media is good for us. It's just all on how you use it. But other people say that it's got addictive qualities and it's really negatively affecting us. Of course. Okay. Well, I guess it comes down to who you're asking. So if I was sat around a dinner table right now and I'm on my phone, my mom would tell me to stop being unsociable and put my phone away. Mm -hmm. but what my mum doesn't realize is that I'm in fact now more sociable than she ever was. I'm connecting to more people around the world than was ever possible before. By connecting to people in an instant opens more opportunities. It builds relationships with people you may never even come across before. And I guess it really comes down to why are you going on social media? On the other side of it, yes, it's having massive, massive mental implications on people's health. You know, it's becoming almost like a comparison website where people are comparing their own lifestyles to these other individuals. Many of them are influencers. And what they don't see is what actually their life is like behind the Instagram posts, because they are often just as mentally unstable or upset as the person that's comparing themselves to. Um, so for me, I've, you've really got to, you've really got a question for these people that are becoming mentally ill on Instagram, what it is that's, what it is that's causing that. I understand the implications of people comparing themselves. I don't think it's healthy, but I also say to them, Instagram's like a magazine, right? In a magazine, you have different articles. If you go to in a shop, a bookshop, there's a whole, whole different array of books, right? And that's like Instagram. You decide which bit, you, you decide which book you pick up the same way you decide who to follow. When you go on Instagram, if you're going on it too much, because it is addictive and it's built to be addictive, what I'm now doing is I've, I've, I've accepted the fact it's addictive and it's not stopping the amount of time I go on it. But what it is changing is every time I now pick up my phone and go on Instagram, I'm now learning something that's relevant to me. So every time I'm now going on Instagram, I'm learning something new. I'm not comparing myself. I'm not getting down about, you know, somebody that's got a brand new car and uh, how, how, you know, even looking at Steve, he's in the social media business. What an amazing, amazing guy to see how far he's come. I know people can compare themselves and think, God, look at him. Look at how young he is. Look at what he's achieved. Why am I not there? You know, what I'm doing now is I'm following people where they're providing value to me. So every time I pick them up my phone, I'm learning something. And I think Mm -hmm. people should do the same. 
Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's all in how you use it. And again, to bring up Steve, his big thing right now, big kick I've seen him talking about is what you fill your feed with and make sure you follow things that bring you value and don't follow people exactly that bring you down in negative content. Exactly and the, my point. And the other thing too is the connectivity part. I agree with you 100% that it's just bringing the world closer together. And I like with this podcast, the specific one, like you and I would have never spoken or met had it not been for social media. Exactly. Right. So I do think that there's a lot of positives to it and it just comes down to how you use it. But in terms of how you use it, I feel like another quote that I heard you say at one point, which I feel like is really applicable to social media right now is you spent a shitload of money trying to impress people. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like when, like, cause this quote say you used to do that and then you stopped. So when did that realization come in with you where you kind of stopped spending money just to impress other people? So because I was obviously on such a popular TV show, I think people naturally judge. Everybody judges. I try to live up to my lifestyle from being a TV star, a young TV star. Um, and I had this idea that people always thought I was rich and that I will still be rich. And I tried to live up to it. And that had mental implications. What I'd realized shortly after was that I'm trying to impress people that don't actually give an F about me. They don't. Um, and, you know, I think people should really, really understand why, why would you go out and buy, you know, why would you go out and buy an expensive bag if you can't afford to put anything in it? And all you're doing it for is a post on Instagram to impress who? To impress, like, to, to, to get your likes up. You know, I think that's why Instagram are looking at turning off their likes now. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to have so much positive effect. Can you kind of talk about those positive effects? Because that's actually perfect because that was the next point I was going to ask you about was Instagram removing likes. Yeah, uh, I think it's a massive, massive step. I think it's a great, great move from Instagram that they're understanding and they care about people's mental implications. I don't think it's going to change anything. You know, why do you need to see how many likes somebody's getting? You don't. If you like something, go ahead and like it. You don't need to see how many other people are liking it. Uh, so the fact that they're turning that off, I think, is a step in the right direction to really helping the youth and people with you know, uh, mental illnesses as a result of social media. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you, man. But I wanted to ask you when it comes to content and stuff, like what are some, who are some people you follow, whether it be YouTube or Instagram, Twitter, like what are some content that you're currently consuming? Uh, so I follow a lot of um a lot of investor Instagram pages. Um, I'm in that stage now where I'm trying to raise money. So I like to get in the headspace of an investor, see how they think. Um, <clears throat> I follow Steve. I love to see what he's up to, what he's getting up to. Um, I love his positive quotes, his insights. Um, so yeah, I think as a holistic point of view, I follow pages and content that is relevant to me in my life uh, and also aspirational to where I want to be. Mm. That's awesome, man. But I wanted to ask, what's next for you? What do you have coming up? What's next for me? So next stage right now is raising investment for Social Plug. That's my main focus. Um, so we've been uh, ideating around the cash flow forecast, um, you know, future projections, which is a load of nonsense. It's like putting a finger in your ear, nobody knows. <laughs> Getting the pitch deck together so it's tight. Uh, speaking to different investors, preparing for the pitch. Um, that's been my main focus at the minute. That's awesome. And then when it comes to long-term goals, like how would you quantify what your long-term goal is? My long-term goal is to provide a valuable service to people. Um, whether that's, you know, whether that's through, through social plug, whether that's through a, a film I end up doing that people absolutely end up love. Um, I think my long-term end of goal is to, 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 not, to not only have gratitude, um, but also to provide value. I just think it's so important to provide value. And I would love to really find my foothold in that and, and really be in a position where I'm providing great value to people. I think that'd be an amazing feeling. I like that, man. But before we wrap up, I want to do a quick Q&A with you. It's just some standard questions I ask everybody at the end of every interview. Cool? Let's do it. Perfect. First one being, you're going to dinner. You can take anybody dead or alive and you can take three people. Who do you take to dinner? Wow. Wow. Uh, I'm going to take Bob Lazar. 
Okay. Bob Lazar from Airy 51. He's coming with me, man. Uh, I want to know what's going on. Um, I would take Joe Rogan. Okay. Absolutely love Joe Rogan. Uh, who else would I take? Great question. I don't know about the third one. I'd have to think about that, man. That's fair. These are always the questions that people struggle with the most. So it's okay if you don't have a complete answer. Second question. What is the best advice that you've ever, some of the best advice you've ever been given? Listen. Just listen. Um, I think it's so easy for people to have a conception or an idea and run away with it. I think it's, and that's not only in business, but also in person, personal circumstances. Uh, You know, if you're coming across a problem, whether that's for a relationship, whether that's for a family issue, uh, whether that's in business, I think just the most powerful thing is just to listen. Uh, And you will not believe how much people love to not only talk about themselves, uh, but also will give you more of an insight into what the actual problem is. Uh, so for me, yeah, just just listen to people and really understand what it is they need or what they're feeling, and that will really really help you in your in your in your steps going forward. Mm, I completely agree, and that's one thing the podcast is helping me with is to listen better than I had did before. Yeah, definitely. When your alarm goes off in the morning, what motivates you to kind of get out of bed and really go after it that day? Uh, my future. I have. Uh, I have big, big ideas of where I want to be in the future. Um, my family, they've done so much for me. Uh, my mum's always, always been there for me from day one. She's given up her life to support me. Uh, I want to busy being, start being in a position to give back to her. Uh, nothing more in the world would make me happier than providing for my family and providing value for people. What is one thing about you people would not expect? One thing about me people would not expect. That's a great question, man. Um, What would people not expect? I think, I think maybe that, I think that comes into listening. I think a lot of people seem to already have preconceptions and judgments on individuals. Uh, I'm, I, I like to read people. I like to listen. Um, so although you may think that I'm not listening or you may think that, um, I'm a certain person or that, or I I act in a certain way, um, it's not always the case. I don't know if that really answers the question. It's, it's a bit of a cloudy, cloudy response, but, um, yeah, I would, I would say, I would say I can, I can adapt to certain circumstances and I, I don't, I don't take things literally i'm always willing to listen and understand what people's point of view are that's fair and this next question this could be listening as well but what's one thing that's so important everybody needs to know to give back to to always 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 look at giving back i think it's so important to be able to offer something before asking for it um you know it goes into social media with with you know i i listen to a, a few of your podcasts um you know obviously that's how we've ended up here today um you know i'm always commenting the people i want to talk to or want to go and meet i'm always listening to see what they're interested in uh, i'm showing an interest in, in what they care about and i think it's so important yeah just to give before you receive and you would not believe where that gets you mm-hmm. i agree and i just want to say thank you for listening to the podcast by the way i appreciate that and no honestly the- i think it's great Thanks. Uh, for the final question, I kind of like to flip the script a little bit. And I want you to know one question that you'd want to know the answer to. If you had a crystal ball that you could ask any question to and you get the answer to, what question would you ask? What's one thing you want to know? What is the purpose of life? Okay. I, I like it. I like it. But I want to thank you, man, for taking the time to come on this podcast. I really appreciate you. I know you've got a busy schedule. So I just want to give you the floor. Uh, where can the people find you? Plug everything and anything that you got right now. Sure. So for anybody that wants to hit me up on Instagram, it's Reese Douglas one. Anybody that wants to follow my uh, social plug Instagram, it's socially plugged. Uh, and for anybody that's just on Twitter, it's at Reese Douglas one. Um, I'm happy for anybody to get in touch with me, ask me any further questions. I'm happy to help them. Um, and yeah, anything, anything that anybody wants, reach out and I will get in touch.
Awesome. Well, I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. And I want to thank you once again for coming on this podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through, you've only listened to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking the time to check this out. Guys, do me a favor. Go and follow Reese. Go and follow Social Plug. Like I said, I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. And if you'd like to follow podcasts, you can find us on Instagram at, at my social life podcast or on YouTube by searching up my social life. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.